السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه الحمد لله today is the I believe thirty sixth part of our Sira program inshallah and last week if you guys remember we talked about a tragic part of the history of the Meccan history and that was the Shaykh Abi Talib where the Banu Hashim was confined, was boycotted and confined to a Shaykh, a valley outside of Mecca for three years and in, during that time of three years that they were basically socially boycotted from the people of Mecca no one was allowed to marry into Banu Hashim, nobody was allowed to do any trades or any kind of transactions with them, no one was allowed to send any food to them. People did secretly send Muslims and non-Muslims alike, did secretly send food, but that was again secretly done. And we talked about the uh, different um, uh, hardships that the Muslims went under. And if you guys remember, anybody remember the, the hardship that, what, what is Sa'ad ibn Ubi Waqas, he narrates a uh, somewhat, it's somewhat disgusting because it's something, but that's something that people are forced to do when they're put in that kind of situation. So something Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he was forced to do. But something you know again people forced in that kind of situation and we talked about how uh, you know the Muslims all over the world people who are put into these kind of situations the hardships they are going through and then we talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through uh, actually efforts of non-Muslims they helped to abolish that treaty or that agreement and uh, we see we talked about how uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses sometimes uses non-Muslim to even further the cause of deen. And this doesn't tell us, this doesn't mean that we just as Muslims sit back and relax and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of it, but we have to do our best. We see nowadays all over the world, when these humanitarian crises all over the world, you see a lot of non-Muslims going there to help them. Some of them, they're going for missionary work and whatever, they have other intentions, whatever. But then the people who are going for the ikhlas, they have, they have the sincerity, they're doing it to help them. Basically, because they can't see a fellow human in, in suffering like that. So that, that teaches us as Muslims that we have actually more of a right upon us, that we need to go and do whatever we can to help them. So whatever food, uh, whatever money we can send to them as aid, whatever, you know, like now the winter's coming, blankets and that kind of stuff. I think uh, one of the, I forgot what, which organization it was, they're giving blankets, uh, which are $10 for a big blanket. I'm sure it can, it can be enough for one or two people at least in a family. So these kind of things, you know, we should try our best, inshallah, to um, help out these people in need, inshallah ta'ala. Now, after the treaty was abolished, and the Muslims uh, and also the non-Muslims of Banu Hashim, when the family of the tribe of Banu Hashim came back to Makkah Mukarramah, now we know that three years of hardship and eating leaves and you know all this, uh, what they had to go through, uh, it took a toll on many of the Sahaba and many of the people who are the family of the Prophet And uh, it was especially Abu Talib who was uh, around 85 years old. This is the 10th year of the mission. Abu Talib was 85 years old. And imagine that three years he spent with his nephew out in the middle of the desert. So you could just imagine what that did to him. So the, the, the Prophet says at this moment was 50 years old. Okay, So Abu Talib is basically about 35 years older than Rasulullah So uh, just a few days actually after they came back to Mecca, when they came back to their homes, Abu Talib was already sick and then he got worse and he actually passed away just a few days after coming back uh, to Mecca. Now when he was on his deathbed, the Prophet ﷺ came to visit him and remember again the Prophet ﷺ wants his uncle to accept this Kalima Taiba and become Muslim so he can be saved uh, in the hereafter. 
That's what the Prophet ﷺ's main concern was for every single human in the world. So the Prophet ﷺ visited him in his time, at his time of death. He's on his deathbed. And at that point, uh, Abu Jahl and Abdullah ibn Umayyah, these two of the mushrikeen, were sitting beside Abu Talib's bed. So Rasulullah ﷺ came in, and the Prophet ﷺ is saying to his uncle, he says, I am that, oh my uncle, I am uh, kalimatan indallah. He says that, say this kalima, say la ilaha illallah, so I can be a intercessor for you. I can, I can, uh, I can basically be like uh, an agent for you on the day of judgment, and I can speak to Allah subhanahu wa taala to take you to jannah, to put you into jannah. Just say the kalima, just say the words, and inshallah, I will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa taala to take you to jannah. And Abu Talib, being in that position. Uh, on his deathbed and being you know Abu Jahl and those guys next to him he says yabna akhi oh my nephew lawla an tu'ayyirani quraish la aqrartu aynayk biha he says that if it wasn't for the quraish that they would taunt me and after i die they would make fun of me and you know and soil my name basically then i would have said these words just to please your eyes just to please you i would have said these words and i would surely enter into your into your deen um we know that the ayat uh, came down. So Abu Talib, he did this. He kept on saying, uh, he, he said this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Abu Jahl and Abdullah ibn Umayyah, they kept on insisting and repeating, saying that, are you going to leave the religion of your father, Abdul Muttalib? Are you going to leave his religion? They kept on saying this and taunting him and saying this to him until the last word that came out of his mouth before he passed away. He says, Ala millati Abdul Muttalib. That I am dying on the deen or the religion of my father Abdul Muttalib, and he died. He passed away in that form, uh, in that way. Uh, one of the ayat that came down, Surah Al Qasas, ayah number fifty-six, was revealed uh, after this occasion, and up basically uh, in revelation to this occasion. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Inna ka la tahdi man ahbabt, walakin Allah yahdi man yasha, wa huwa a'lamu bil muhtadin." That Allah subhan- that you do not guide who you love or you want. So whoever you want to be guided and you yearn for their uh, for their guidance and you want them to be guided, for example, Abu Talib, his own uncle, that's not gonna happen. What you want does not happen, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who are the muhtadin here, he knows who those are who, who seek guidance. So Abu Talib, he passed away in this way. And there is actually a narration. This is from Sahih Bukhari, this, this narration. So it's authentic. There is another narration from Ibn Ishaq, uh, which is uh, obviously it's weaker. And uh, they say that uh, Abbas uh, was also there in the room. And that uh, Abu Talib was moving his lips right before he died. And Abbas put his ear next to his lips. And then he heard him say the kalima. And then he told the Prophet that he said what you wanted him to say. Uh, there, that narration there, and there's ikhtilaf with some ulama who take that narration. They said, no, he died as a Muslim. But the other ulama say there's authentic hadith and even these ayat that were revealed in connection with this, with this uh, incident. And they say that no, Abu Talib died as a non-Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ, after seeing his uncle die, he was, again, he was devastated as his beloved uncle uh, passed away on on, uh, on kufr. He, he passed away as a on, as a non-Muslim, and a person who passes away as a non-Muslim, there's no salvation after that. As long as a person dies with iman, even if their iman is the weakest of iman, but that person, and one day that person will be saved from jahannam. But the people who die on kufr, there's no salvation for them. There's no hope for them. They would they die on kufr and they will remain in jahannam. So the Prophet says, and there's actually uh, narrations about that, where uh, Abbas Radhan asked the Prophet Sallallahu that what happened to my brother? What will happen to my brother? And the Prophet Sallallahu responded that he will have, because of all the help that he gave, and the Nusra and the help he gave for the effort of deen, because of that, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa has lightened his load. So he is one of those who has fire up to his ankles or under his sandals. Uh, and because of that, his, boil, his, his brain is boiling due to that fire. And that is the lightest of punishment in hellfire. So he's getting that lightened punishment because of all the things he did uh, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and for the, for the, for the religion. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right after his, his uncle passed away, he said 
that I will do istighfar on your behalf. I will seek forgiveness on your behalf from Allah SWT as long as I am not prohibited from doing this. So the Prophet would start, he started doing istighfar and asking Allah SWT to forgive his uncle, again who died as a kafir. And then Allah SWT revealed the ayat, uh, Surah Tawbah, ayah uh, number 113. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان ما كان للنبي والذين آمنوا أن يستغفروا للمشركين ولو كانوا أولي قربة من بعد ما تبين لهم أنهم أصحاب الجحيم. That it does not, it's not suitable, it's not good for uh, for the for a prophet and the people who have believed that they do istighfar, they seek forgiveness on behalf of the mushrikeen. ولو كانوا أولي قربة even if they are close relatives. So even if they're close relatives, it's not good, it's not suitable, it's not right for them to do istighfar on their behalf. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ After they have come to know and after it's been clear, أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ That they are from the people of healthcare. So we're not allowed to, before they die, yes, you do as much dua as you can for the hidayah of your uh, your cousin, your, 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 you know, your uncle. And this is not, you know, alhamdulillah, as people who were born into uh, Islam and families that are Muslim. Alhamdulillah, we don't have to come around that. But, you know, if you ask the Muslim brothers and sisters, you know, who come to the masjid who, uh, in our community, for example, all the different, you know, trials and the fitna, you know, that it hurts them. Their own parents are not Muslim, for example. And whenever they try to give them da'wah, their parents don't want to listen, for example. Their brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes parents, they become Muslim and their daughter or their son don't want to become Muslim. Uh, and it hurts them. But after they, so before they, they have passed away and they, before they go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're allowed to do dua for them and you're supposed to do dua for them for their hidayah as much as possible. But once they die and you know that they died on kufr, you're not allowed to do a safar on their behalf. Basically, they're, they've gone to whatever they put behind, in front of them. So we see that the Prophet sallallahu uh, he was stopped from doing dua for uh, for Abu Talib after this and again he was devastated he was worried because every single person that um, uh, he wanted every everyone to go to Jannah that was his goal and his uncle his beloved uncle who took care of him and you know he lived with him for years that same uncle uh, is passing away on Kufr now one question that may come to mind is that what about all those years of help that he offered to the Prophet and to the Muslims, those three years of hardship that he endured with the Prophet in, in Shaykh Abi Talib. And the reason why he was there in Shaykh Abi Talib was why? Because he wasn't giving up the Prophet. He wasn't giving up protection of the Prophet. So they said, okay, all of you guys, all of Banu Hashim, you guys go to this Shaykh, to this valley. So what's the response to that? Like if if someone gives so much effort, and even like I was saying earlier, those people who go to Syria, those people who go to Palestine, those people, you know, there was that, that young uh, Christian woman, I forgot her name, she was, she was run, run over by a tank in Israel, right? In, 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 uh, in Palestine, she was run over by the tank. And she gave her, basically she gave her life. So, you know, what, what about those efforts? What happened, are they in just in vain? And the, the response the ulama say, is that when a person does good, Allah SWT actually gives them back in this life. So whatever, you know, He gives them blessings in this life. Uh, and then those who are sincere that uh, they, they, they want Hidayah, Allah SWT gives them Hidayah. So we see here Abu Talib, he actually rejected it. He didn't want Hidayah and that's why he didn't get that Hidayah. It's not forced upon someone. Now, after a few days after Abu Talib had passed away, the Prophet's beloved wife and his only wife at that time, Khadija anha, passed away. So they were uh, they were married at that time 25 years, 25 years of marriage. And uh, Khadija she passed away. She was 65 years old at that time. And uh, the Prophet his his love for her did not even stop at that. You know, usually when a person passes away, person cries for one, two days, few days, maybe a few weeks. And then after that, they go back to their lives and they're, they're back to normal and they kind of even forget that person. The Prophet ﷺ, years later, when he was in Medina Munawwara, he would remember Khadija Radal Anha. Uh, Khadija Radal Anha's sister, Hala, her name was Hala Radal Anha, she would come and the way she would knock on the door of the Prophet's house, 
she would knock in a certain way and the Prophet would be reminded of his beloved wife because the knocking of sisters are the same. That's how much he loved uh, Khadija anha. He would send uh, gifts and presents to the family of Khadija anha. And Aisha anha, she actually got jealous one day. She said that you know, you're, you're remembering this old woman basically and, and the Prophet ﷺ got upset with her. And he said, no, she's not. She was the one who gave me, she was my pillar. She was helping me throughout all those years when no one else accepted me. No one else believed in me. She gave me that, that help. So we see how uh, the, the love of the Prophet ﷺ went on for years. Now, uh, after uh, Abu Talib had passed away, uh, Abu Talib has passed away, and then Khadija has, has passed away, um, now it was open season. Now the kuffar had nothing to be afraid of because uh, Abu Talib, even though he's the he was the leader, now he passed away. His brother Abu Lahab, uh, sorry, um, uh, Abu Jahl, I believe, became the leader right then. Uh, after that, and the thing is that um, the, they started to torture and and uh, and abuse the prophet ﷺ even more so you know we talked about the torture of the prophet ﷺ before where they try to you know wrap a cloth around his neck and they would choke him or they would beat him they would you know throw junk on him and and stuff while he's praying uh, most likely that probably occurred after abu talib had passed away because now there's no one there to protect the prophet ﷺ. so these death threats these things increased and increased now the prophet ﷺ, uh he uh, after after losing these two pillars, these strong pillars that were helping him, he had to find uh, a, a place for the Muslims to go to. So now he started reaching out, and we know we'll talk about that a little bit more about the Hajj in that next week, inshallah. But he started reaching out. Excuse me. He started reaching out to different places, and one of the things that he did uh, was go to uh, Taif. And, and one thing to mention is this, this year actually, uh, the journey of Taif, um, the death of Abu Talib and Khadija anha, anha, uh, when uh, this year is the 10th year of the mission and it's called Amul Huzn. Amul Huzn. What, anybody know what that means? The year of sorrow. Okay, the year of sorrow and the year of sorrow meaning because he lost these two family members and then also the Taif which we're going to talk about in a second. So journey to Taif. He went to Taif to find a new, uh, basically a capital or a, or a base for Islam so that he can take the Muslims and go. And also remember again, the Prophet ﷺ, he's increasing death threats and they're trying to kill him in Mecca. So now he knew that the people of Mecca, they are not going to accept. So we have to go outside. We have to start looking outside. So Rasulullah ﷺ goes to Taif. And Taif, uh, there's a tribe called Banu Thaqif in Taif and they were actually there was three brothers who were the leaders of Taif Abdul Abd, Abd Yalil Habib and Mas'ud these are the three brothers who were the leaders of the of the of Banu Thaqif now the Prophet ﷺ sat with them and he gives them da'wah to Islam he gives he explains uh, you know that the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he talks to them and he says I'm the last I'm the last messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he gives them da'wah and they actually respond, they had no intention of, of listening to him anyways. And they respond to him in a nasty way. One of them, he says that, you know, uh, you're, you're just below me. I'm not even going to talk to you. Uh, one thing is Banu Thaqif and the Makkans of Quraysh, they kind of had a rivalry too. So that's one of the things. So they're like, you know, why, why should I believe you? You're, too, you're below me. I'm not even going to talk to you. That's one, one of them says. Another one, he says that, you know, if you are a prophet, then I am not suitable to talk to you. Meaning you're too high of a position that I can even talk to you. And if you're not a prophet, if you're lying, then I don't want to talk to you anyways. So you're just making, they're just making up excuses, right, basically. So they talk to him in this nasty way. And the Prophet ﷺ gets up from, his gathering, from the gathering and he's going. Now he's planning to go back to Makkah Mukarramah at that point, but they had other plans in mind. And maybe they even had this set up from before Allah Alam, whatever, but they got the children and the youth from their from Taif and they sent them after the Prophet. ﷺ. They said, okay, stone him and just basically, you know, kick him out of the city. So they came and they're coming after the Prophet ﷺ with stones 
pelting the feet of the Prophet uh, pelting the body of the Prophet and Rasulullah was with Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha, his um, uh, adopted son, we talked about him way in the beginning, he was with him on this journey. And Rasulullah SAW is being pelted with stones and he's bleeding all the way. Even they said that when he was walking, you know, the um, when you do wudu and your sandals, they, you know, you're walking and the sandals get stuck to the bottom of your feet and that sound it makes. It was even making those so- that kind of sound and it was getting stuck to his feet. That's how much blood he had because of the stoning. Zayd ibn Haritha rather than tried his best to protect the Prophet but they would kept on stoning him and Rasulullah SAW out of weakness, it was hot, remember, uh, it was hot outside and uh, weakness and, and the blood. He would sit down and these kids and these youth, they would grab the Prophet from his arms, his shoulders. They would pick him up and they started pushing him again. So they did this to the, the Prophet Rasulullah kept on continuously doing this for a few miles. They kept and they chased him basically like this. And the Prophet went outside of uh, Taif and there's actually a masjid in this area. Where there, there's a garden there uh, where now it's a masjid built there where the Prophet took rest and this garden was actually owned by two brothers of the leaders of, of Quraysh in Mecca and that was uh, Utba ibn Rabi'ah and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah these two brothers and these are the, actually staunch enemies of Islam but they own this and you know it's kind of like a maybe like a vacation home because Taif is in the mountains so it's in the summer especially a lot of families go there for vacation. It's a nice area too because of the wind and stuff and get away from the hot, from the heat. You go to Taif. So they had this land there and they had a garden there. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ went, he, was, he went and he took refuge in that garden. And Utba and Shayba were actually there and they saw what the people of Taif had done to the Prophet ﷺ. And they felt sorry for him because at the end he was still related to them. They were still like cousins, second cousins, you know, related somehow. So the, they felt sorry for him. So they sent a bowl of grapes with one of their slaves. They had a slave, his name was Adas. And they sent him to go and offer these grapes to the Prophet Sallallahu and t- basically tend to his wounds. So Adas comes with these grapes uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu And Rasulullah Sallallahu is uh, uh, conversing with him. And remember the Prophet always, always doing that, always talking about uh, about Deen, always, you know, uh, in the effort of Deen. So he sees Adas and he says, you know, where where are you from? And he says, I am from Nainawa. It's a, it's a city. I'm not sure exactly where, but he says, I'm from this uh, city called Nainawa. And the Prophet says, oh, that's the same city where my Akhi Yunus, my brother Yunus ibn Matta, والسلام, the Prophet Yunus, والسلام, that's where he's from. And Adas hearing this, he said, what? How do you Arabs know about Yunus? He was Christian. This uh, Adas was Christian, but they basically, they, uh, they uh, believed in Prophet Yunus. So he said, how do you know about Yunus? The Prophet said that I am a prophet just like him. So he gives them a few talk, uh, for a couple minutes of da'wah. And this Adas, Utba and Shaybar are watching from a distance. The same Adas, this slave that they just sent a few minutes earlier, he's now kissing the hands and feet of the Prophet He has become Muslim. And they're like, look at this. <laughs> and we sent uh, grapes to the Prophet and now he's even turning, converting our slaves. Now, the Prophet after resting a little bit, he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says a very beautiful dua. It is a long, a pretty, uh, kind of long dua. So, I mean, it will take maybe a while to memorize. But I would advise myself especially, we should always uh, try to memorize the du'as of the Prophet and they're beautiful du'as and this is a very beautiful du'a uh, the Prophet says this is the rawaya of Tabarani and the Prophet says turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, he, he did two rak'ah of prayer and then he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says Allahumma ilayka ashku da'fa quwwati that oh Allah I'll translate after so he says da'fa quwwati wa qillat hilati wa hawani ala nas anta arham rahimin ila man takiluni إلى عدو يتجهمني أو إلى قريب ملكته أمري إن لم تكن غضبان علي فلا أبالي غير أن عافيتك غير أن عافيتك أو سعولي أعوذ بنور وجهك الذي أشرقت أشرقت له الظلمات والصلح عليه أمر الدنيا والآخرة 
أن تنزل بغضبك أو تحل علي سخطك لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك So the Prophet makes this dua It's a very beautiful dua He says that O oh my Lord O oh my Allah I turn to you I turn to you and I complain of my weakness So he says he's not blaming the situation He's not blaming the people of Taif, but he's saying that's my weakness, that I complain to you of my weakness. Uh, the lack of support and humiliation I am made to receive. And I, I basically complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this. Most compassionate and merciful. You are the Lord of the weak. Arhamur Rahimin. That uh, uh, you're here, the translation is not that good, but Arhamur Rahim, Arhamur Rahimin. That you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. And you are my Lord. To whom did you leave me? Okay, to a distant person who receives me with hostility, or to an enemy you give, you have given power over me. As long as you are not, now listen to this part. As long as you are not displeased with me. Then fala ubali. I don't care. So I don't care if the, the all the people in the heavens and earth come against me and they try to kill me or they you know do whatever they want to me. But as long as you are happy with me, I don't care. So this is the connection that the Prophet had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that uh, that that your afia is awsa. It's it's but it's better for me to ask for afi and that's why we're always supposed to ask for afi we're not supposed to ask for tests and trials we always ask allah subhanahu wa allahumma inni as'aluka al-yaqeen wal afwa wal afiya fi dunya wal akhirah so we ask this this is one of the du'as of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we always ask for afiya don't ask for bala don't ask for fitna because we might not be able to uh, handle the fitna the tests and trials so we always ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his divine protection uh, and then if a test does come to us then we remain steadfast and, and be patient. So the Prophet says this, that I seek refuge in the light of your face by which all darkness is dispelled and both uh, both in this life and the here and the hereafter. And yeah I don't like this translation but let me just translate myself. So and then he says uh that I that I that your uh, your anger descends upon me. Or your, uh, again, sakhat is also like anger or displeasure, that your di- displeasure comes upon me. That everything is for you, basically. Until you are pleased. And there's no, there's no might or power except with you. That Allah SWT, you have, the, you have complete power over everything. So this is the dua that the Prophet said, uh, made at that time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that dua right away. Jibreel was sent down with another angel, the angel who was in control of the mountains. And Jibreel says to the Prophet that this angel is with me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us down. If you wish, he can just put both mountains together and crush these people in between these mountains. And the Prophet being who he is, being the merciful, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being uh, Rahim and being the one who the way he treated people and the way he was uh, wor- worried about the people he did not seek re- revenge he did not seek any revenge at that time he actually says that uh, even if these people do not accept Islam maybe someone from their progeny might become Muslim so he says this and uh, they are saved from the wrath of Allah SWT because of the Prophet Sallallahu and we see that the fruits of that of that patience that the Prophet Sallallahu had and did not destroy them if it was one of us I mean we would just say get rid of them I don't want to see their faces again but the Prophet Sallallahu being so merciful he said uh, maybe the one of their well even if one of their uh, children become Muslim that's enough for me so do spare them and uh, at that point we see that 12 years, about 12 years after this incident, uh, Banu Thaqif actually became Muslim. And we said, you know, those three brothers, Abd, Yalil, Habib, and Mas'ud, those are the three brothers that were the leaders of uh, Banu Thaqif. One of them, Mas'ud, he had a son. Anybody know what's his name? He was a Sahabi. 
صحيح؟ أبو نعم نعم أبو مسعود عروة ابن مسعود Yeah, Urwa ibn Mas'ud, رضي الله عنه. He actually, and he's the one who um, we'll talk about that later when it comes. But in Hudaybiyah, he came to visit the Muslims and see the situation. And he's the one who reports. He goes back to Makkah, goes back to the Quraysh. He says, whatever that man tells you to do, do it. Just accept whatever he wants. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? Why are you talking like this? He says that I have gone to the palaces of Caesar of of. Uh, Khazros of, of the Najashi of the the Yemen. I've gone to all these different courts and these kings and I have never seen anyone love their leader like the Sahaba loved the Prophet. That when he's doing wudu, they're fighting each other to to grab whatever remnants of that wudu falling off the Prophet's limbs and they're taking it and they're anointing it on their faces, rubbing their bodies with that. That was Urwa ibn Masood. Uh, and then he wasn't Muslim at that time. Then later on, he becomes Muslim. And Urwa ibn Mas'ud actually is sent to his own people, to Banu Thaqif. And while giving da'wah to them, he goes there on a mission to give them da'wah. And he's actually killed by his own, those same Banu Thaqif, the ones who stoned the Prophet. They actually killed Urwa ibn Mas'ud, the, the son of their leader or their previous leader. Or one, basically, he's he's also one of their leaders. They ki- they killed him. He became shaheed because he was giving da'wah to them and he was inviting them to Islam. Uh, so this was Urwa ibn Masood. And then later on, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly timeline. After that, they actually then after that they all came and they became Muslim, the people of Taif. And we see now they everyone in Taif is Muslim. Uh, one other thing about Urwa ibn Masood, there's something related to him. And Isa alayhi salam. Anybody know what that is? There's a hadith of the Prophet. So the Prophet says that uh, that he saw the Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so the Prophet saw a dream one time where he saw a man walking, making tawaf of the Kaaba, and he's leaning on two people's shoulders. And uh, he, he, he was basically, uh, he was asked who, who was that. They said that this, the, he, sorry, he says that this is Isa Isa. So he saw Isa Isa in his dream, and he says that Urwa ibn Mas'ud resembles Isa Isa the most. So basically, Urwa ibn Mas'ud looked just like Isa Isa. So that's one of the things about Urwa ibn Masood. So that was from Banu Thaqif. So we see that the people of Thaqif, the people of Taif, became Muslim. The entire city became Muslim. And that was because of the patience of the Prophet ﷺ and the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, one, oh yeah, one other thing to mention really quick, inshallah, is that later on when the people do become Muslim, the people of Taif, they had a certain idol. Uh, I'm not sure if it was... Uzza or Lat or I'm not sure which one it was the name of the idol but they had this idol in, in Taif and the Prophet ﷺ told them hey, when you go back you need to destroy the idol and they said well we're not going to do that because our people you know they were scared they, even though they became Muslim but they were fresh in Islam so they still had you know fear that this idol maybe something bad is going to happen to us if we, kill the, if we break this idol so the Prophet ﷺ sent two uh, to the Sahaba to go to um, uh, Thaqif and they actually go one of them he goes up to break the idol and the people say you know we're warning you if you break this idol the gods are gonna do this to you or they're gonna do this to you whatever so he actually goes up and he br- he, he hits the idol he breaks it and then all of a sudden he goes uh, 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 and he falls down and everyone's watching and we see, we told you, we see what will happen to your companion. And then this man stands up and he goes, what are you talking about, you fools? That, I was just joking, he, just, he faked his own death. He's making, making fun of them. And he said that this idol cannot do anything. Allah SWT is the one that owns and controls the universe. So that was one of the things that happened with Banu Thaqif later on. Anyways, uh, the Prophet after uh, this dua and after this incident with the angels, he goes back towards Makkah. Uh, Makkah Mukarma with Zayd ibn Haritha an. and as he's going now the Prophet says remember he left Makkah to go find a base in Taif 
or to make establish a base in Taif. Now he is not going to be able to. If he tries to go back into Makkah, they might try again to kill him. Try to kill him. So the Prophet actually sent word to a man named Mutaim ibn Adi, and this is we talked about him last week. He was one of those who helped in the abolishment of the of the treaty or the boycott, you know, agreement. So Mutaim ibn Adi agreed to give jiwar protection of, to the Prophet So he actually got. Uh, went home, brought his sons, and they all they with full armor. They took their swords, their you know quiver and you know shield and whatever, and they got on a camel and they went with the Prophet Sallallahu next to the the Kaaba. They made tawaf with the Prophet Sallallahu and then they announced in front of everyone that Muhammad Sallallahu is under our jiwar, under our protection, so no one is allowed to touch him. And that's what how the Prophet was. Uh, he came back into Mecca and he continued to give da'wah. So we'll talk about, inshallah, the, the different tajawwul uh, or uh, gasht that the Prophet would make. He would go to the different hujjaj, the different uh, groups who had come for hajj, and he would give da'wah to them. We're going to talk about that, inshallah. Uh, we're going to also talk about a uh, little bit, uh, probably the week after maybe or something, we'll, we'll talk about Isra wal Mi'raj, uh, which happened soon after this. إن شاء الله جزاك الله خير سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله